Uh, there's this half joke saying around that the universe is held together with duct tape. Uh, and just kind of building off of that uh, in a primitive situation, okay, your world is literally tied together with twine. Uh, that's the main fastener. Uh, you think you go into the hardware store, a lot of the things that are in the hardware store are simply different kinds of fasteners. And in a primitive situation, uh, that pretty much boils down to cordage. Uh, different joints with wood carving, you know, being a second one there, but cordage is still by far the main one. And so if you're going to be working with cordage, you've got to learn some knots. There's three main types of knots, and, and this goes by, you know, their names. And, and there's actually a fourth category, uh, well, depending on how you, how you do it. But the first one are knots. These are things that are tied in the end of the cordage, okay? Just the end of the cord, something I'm doing there, maybe like making a loop with a bowline. Uh, the second one are called bends. Bends are used to tie two pieces of cordage together. And I think I have a bend, here we go. Here's a bend, okay? Uh, this is a fisherman's knot, uh, which is actually should be fisherman's bend, uh, but just tying two pieces of cordage together, okay? That's a bend. And the third use is when you need to tie the cordage to something, okay? Like tying it to a stick, okay? Um, and those are called hitches. And so rather than learning uh, 25 knots to earn the knot tying honor and then not really knowing how to do anything with any of them, uh, I'm suggesting that we learn at least four knots. Uh, one knot, you know, like a tie, be able to tie a loop, that's something real common. Uh, a bend to be able to tie two ropes together. Uh, a hitch to be able to tie the rope to something. And then the fourth category uh, would be to be able to tie up bundles, because that's something that we frequently do too. Uh, maybe have a bundle of sticks or a bundle of thatching uh, or just some kind of a bundle. Uh, and also the, the other uh, use that fits into this category is when you're doing bandaging. You know, you're tying it, you're not really making a bundle of arms, but let's say you have a wound on your arm and you're tying that together. You're going to use the same knot for that, and that's the square knot. Now, keep in mind, don't use the square knot as a bend, okay? Uh, it has earned the name death knot because uh, people have done that, and people, you know, it's the only knot some people learn, and only knot some people know, and so they tie it. But the, but the square knot can easily come undone, which is an advantage for the bandaging, but it's a great disadvantage for when you're tying two ropes together as a bend. And again, it's earned the reputation and, and the name death knot as a result. So I'm suggesting that, um, you know, for practicality's sake, learn the bowline and then the sheet bend for tying two ropes together. Now the bowline and the sheet bend are both the same knot. They're just tied different and using a little different apl application there. And then for a hitch to tie the rope to something, to do two half hitches or a clove hitch there. And those are actually both the same knot too, it just depends on how you're tying it. Whether you're tying the whole knot around the object that you're tying to, or whether you wrap the rope around and then tie it to the rope coming into the, into the object. Um, so those three knots plus the square knot for tying up bundles, and that'll get you by in most situations. And it's much easier to learn three knots than a whole bunch of them that you don't remember and then don't know how to do anything with. A key verse for our ministry has been Proverbs 22, verse 3, and I'm going to teach you the Jimbo or mix match version of it. And what I mean by that is every phrase here comes from one version or another. I just picked and chose so I could have the particular wording I want for a reason I'm going to share with you in a minute. Um, 
And it goes like this, wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it, but foolish people keep going and suffer. So wise people recognize, you know, what's going to happen um, and foresee trouble coming. Now, our, our ability to foresee trouble coming is very limited. You know, God knows the end from the beginning, but we can only have very limited for, you know, ability to foresee the future. And so in the prophecies, God is giving us what's ha going to happen. And so if we're wise, we will study the prophecies so that we'll know what's coming. And as we mentioned earlier, uh, the prophecies talk about God's people being in the wilderness in the end time just before Jesus comes. So if we foresee that coming, and let's take some action to avoid getting into extra trouble at that time. Uh, that's kind of what this whole video has been about. And here, kind of in the last segment, we're kind of pulling a lot of things together. Um, Several years ago, as I was driving from a program we had done in Kentucky to another one I was going to do in South Dakota, you know, driving across the Great Plains, Catty Corner there, just a lot of driving. Uh, and so I was driving and thinking and praying, and, and I happened to start thinking about how uh, it would be nice to have that verse to music, uh, just in the same way that God told Moses to put the law to music so that as the children of Israel were walking through the desert, they were chanting the law and learning it that way. And on our way out uh, east, we uh, had stopped by our daughter's place. They were living in Colorado at the time, and my granddaughter's learning how to play violin, and she had this little violin practice song. And I happened to think about that song. It kind of been in my head anyway. And sure enough, it fit. And so I'm going to put the verse to music here for you. Wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it. Wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it. But foolish people keep going and suffer. But foolish people keep going and suffer. Proverbs 22, verse 3. Proverbs 22, verse 3. And it's a memory device, so it repeats itself, but it works. Um, <clears throat> and the reason I wanted this particular wording is because I, earlier I had put together a graphics based on uh, this proverb. Uh, which gives the second verse to it, which uh, outlines the equipment that we have here on the table, basically. Uh, and the second verse goes like this. Water bottle, cook pot fire, starter tarp and cordage. Water bottle, cook pot fire, starter tarp and cordage. Adequate clothing, bedding, food, pack, knife, and scarf. Adequate clothing, bedding, food, pack, knife, and scarf. Always keep them in your pack. Be sure to keep them in your pack. Because wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it. Wise people foresee trouble coming and avoid it, but foolish people keep going and suffer. But foolish people keep going and suffer. Proverbs 22 verse 3. Proverbs 22 verse 3. <clears throat> now this whole idea started out with a program uh, we were doing many years ago in Arizona, and somebody kind of randomly asked the question, like, oh, if you could only have five items, what would they be? And I asked him, well, is there anything special about the five items? And he says, no, just, you know, what's the, the least number of essential items that you should be sure and have in your pack? And so after a lot of thought and prayer and a bit of experimenting about that, uh, this is what we've come up with and that particular list that's in the song and you know being able to fit that in with the proverbs 22 verse 3 is very nice so we're going to organize our talk here according to that water bottle being the first one uh, we already talked about water bottle in the water section of this video uh, if at all possible have a stainless steel water bottle uh, because you could 
boil water in that or even cook in it. Uh, wide mouth would be much easier to work with than uh, narrow mouth uh, if you're doing that. Uh, <clears throat> I made this little uh, netting bag, I guess, to go with it. Uh, it keeps it from rolling around uh, and also cuts down on the shininess and, and so on. So water bottles, probably the item in your kit that you're going to use the most. It's also when it's full of water going to be the heaviest. Uh, but because you're using it so much, it's definitely worth carrying. Uh, the next item on the list is a cook pot. Um, notice I have the cook pots in a bag here. That is because when you cook over a fire, it gets all this black sticky stuff and you don't want that getting in the rest of the things in your pack. So you can kind of put it in a bag and isolate it that way. Now you notice that this cook pot here is just a can. You know, at home this is a piece of trash. Out in the woods when you're surviving, this is one of your most valuable possessions. So I'll warn you, studying and practicing wilderness survival is going to mess with your values, but in a good way. Uh, we just added a bale. This is a very uh, simple and easy project. Uh, I wish these cans were just a little bit bigger, but the bigger sizes, you know, either get taller or a lot bigger and, and more awkward to work with. So this is a pretty decent size for personal use. Um, clean, you know, burn the lacquer and stuff out of these, clean them up, and then oil them and season them very similar like you would cast iron cookware. If you want something a little more substantial than uh, just a can, which as you can see this one's been used, I've eaten a lot of meals out of a can just like this one, and or this one. Uh, this is something I got at a um, yard sale. Uh, the cook pot, I mean the, the bowl, stainless steel bowl here. I like the stainless steel better. I uh, don't have to worry about it rusting. It's a little stronger. And again, I just added a bale. Uh, it's a little bigger around to, actually you want the, the diameter and the depth to about be the same. Uh, this one has like a larger diameter, but uh, it's still workable. Um, and it has a little bit more capacity, which I like about this one. Uh, so I, I could boil this full of water and have enough to fill the canteen. Again, keep it in the bag. Keep the rest of your stuff from getting all messed up. Okay, so water bottle, cook pot, fire starter is next. This is a flint and steel set uh, that we featured in the fire starting segment. Um, it has the steel striker, which is the business end of it, and a rock in there to strike sparks on. Oh, here it is. And so you catch those sparks on a piece of charred cloth that you keep in the tin. Uh, tin it's also so that you can make more charred cloth. Uh, putting a um, cord on the, the striker really helps. A lot of these have been lost in the excitement of getting a fire because in the dirt they look very, uh, they're very camouflaged and can get lost. Uh, I have some other uh, jute twine in here uh, so that I can use for to make tinder bundle as well as a piece of fat wood for wet weather fire building. Okay, so water bottle, cook pot, fire starter, tarp uh, that's underneath the blanket here. We talked about this in the shelter section, so I'm not going to unfold all of that. Water bottle, cook pot, fire starter, tarp, cordage. <sighs> I like using just regular jute twine. Uh, it's strong enough for most purposes, and if it gets left behind, it's gonna biodegrade quickly. Uh, you can also shred this up for emergency tinder if you need it. Uh, so that works really well. Uh, twine bobbin here to wrap it on is a good carving project. I also carry a little bit of parachute cord, uh, just because this is stronger, you know, strong enough to hold your weight. Uh, it's a good idea to have a little bit of that along. You might want more than what I have here. That's okay. Okay, so water bottle, cook pot, 
fire starter, tarp, cordage, adequate clothing. The main item of adequate clothing, um, now keep in mind that adequate clothing in the Mojave Desert in the summertime is going to be very different than adequate clothing in Alaska in the middle of winter. Okay, uh, and so that's going to vary from place to place and season to season. Uh, but in generally, I like to keep uh, at least a, a wool hat in my survival kit. Uh, the reason for that is you're going to lose over 70% of your body heat from your neck up. And so a simple wool hat like this is going to go a long ways towards keeping you warm. Uh, it's also a bag if you, you know, need a bag for to put something that you're gathering in. Uh, and so on. Uh, the other item uh, that goes with the clothing idea is a scarf. Uh, this is a coalition scarf or schmog as they call them. Uh, also kafia is another name for them. I understand these have been in use since Abrahamic times at least. Uh, so this goes around your neck to keep your neck warm and that can be real helpful. Okay, water bottle, cook pot, fire starter, tarp, cordage, adequate clothing, bedding. Uh, I have a wool blanket here. Uh, this is uh, probably thicker than what you would want to take on a Sabbath afternoon hike, but uh, if I was going to spend the night, this is what I would, you know, with a blanket, this is what I would want to have. Sleeping bag could also fit that category. Uh, just, you know, sleeping bag's just a glorified blanket anyway. So something for bedding. <clears throat> Water bottle, cook pot, fire starter, tarp, cordage, adequate clothing, bedding, food. Uh, this is just a sample of food here. I wish I had more, but basically you want uh, stuff that's very nutritious, uh, lightweight, and easy to carry, and it's things that isn't, aren't going to get crushed up uh, in your pack. You also want something that you can eat. Uh, without having to uh, do any cooking and also something that you can cook uh, if you want a warm meal. Now in this particular bag right now I don't have any of the things that you could just eat. Usually I have some hardtack uh, but I'm not sure where that's at right now. We've been moving a bit and some stuff has gotten disorganized so I apologize for that. One of the things you want to be sure and have in here is some salt. Uh, goes a long ways towards making wild edible plants a lot more palatable. Uh, I have some oatmeal in here, uh, which I could, you know, add to soups for to thicken stuff up or make a, uh, like oatmeal for in the morning, uh, some brown sugar to go with that, and uh, some lentils for to make some lentil soup. These are some corn for parching, uh, which would fit the snack category, but it needs to be cooked first. Uh, one other thing I have in here is a, a wooden spoon. Um, I used to not carry a wooden spoon, but uh, going out uh, on Sabbath afternoon especially, uh, sometimes we would stop and make a fire and cook something around the fire and have worship before we'd walk out. And uh, I'd need a spoon for to you know cook with, and I though, didn't carry it because I thought, well, I'm carrying all these tools here. I could easily carve a spoon when I need one. But on a simple you know Sabbath afternoon hike or whatever, you don't um, necessarily want to take the time to carve a spoon then. And so I've started carrying one, uh, kind of a digging stick, the same category there. Uh, so anyway, it's the food. Uh, water bottle, cook pot, fire starter, tarp, cordage, adequate clothing, bedding, food, pack. The main thing about a pack is you need something that'll fit you. Okay, this particular one is about 30 liters. Uh, I'm not sure what that translates into in cubic inches, but they're, they're measuring packs pretty much by liters anymore. Um, <clears throat> I find this size to be pretty adequate for what I have here. Uh, it works, it's a little bit full, but um, anyway, it works. Get something that fits you. You know, somebody, 
me being tall like I am, something's going to fit me that might not fit a shorter person, and what works for a shorter person might not work for me, and so on. So, you know, people really want, like, what pack do I get? Well, I don't know, because you need what fits you. Uh, so ideally, go down to the, the sporting goods store, whichever one you're getting your pack from, and hopefully you'll be able to load it up with uh, some weight and wear it around a little bit so that you know how it feels with weight in it and, and you know, get what's going to work for you uh, that feels comfortable for you and, and so on. Um, that's the bottom line. Okay, water bottle, cook pot, fire starter, tarp, cordage, adequate clothing, bedding, food, pack, knife. Understand that this knife category includes all these sharp edge cutting tools. Um, this is, happens to be the knife I like best right now. Uh, I like wearing it around my neck where it's handy there. I don't like things on my waist. I keep getting tangled up with them. That's just a matter of personal preference. If you're just starting out, I would suggest that you get a Mora and a stainless steel blade. Uh, stainless steel is going to be a little easier to keep sharp. Uh, you, you don't have to worry about uh, maintaining the blade like you would a carbon steel blade. Uh, this one has a carbon steel blade, uh, it'll rust easier and so on, and when it rusts then you lose your sharp edge. Uh, so you have to do a little bit more work to maintain a carbon steel blade. But uh, these Moras are just good, no-nonsense knives. Uh, they don't cost very much. I think this one uh, is available for like, I don't know, 12 to $15 range right now. Um, and so, you know, you can, I, I recommend that you get something like this to start with so that you know what a good knife is, how a good knife works, so that you're not spending a lot of money on uh, something that isn't really what you need. Now, the handle on this is a bit big for some people. It fits me fine, uh, but I have larger hands. Uh, another, uh, this one is like the cousin to this. It's also by Mora. Um, this one's been used a little bit more. Uh, it has a little bit uh, more ergonomic handle grip. Uh, some people like that. Uh, but it, basically the knife part of it's the same. And I'm um, going to pay a little bit more for this one. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the price on these are now. This is the companion model. Uh, and they come in different colors and stuff as well. Uh, so everybody should have their own knife and then beyond that it'd be a good idea for people to carry at least one of these other three tools. Ideally when you get to camp and you start doing things you're going to want all three but it isn't practical for one person to carry them all uh, because I'm frequently leading trips where uh, nobody else brings anything but me. I typically will take uh, a bush knife and this, a saw the the bush knife uh this is a cold steel bushman uh relatively inexpensive i've added the the leather handle here for a little better grip um i actually prefer something a little bit longer i think this has a nine inch blade and or a, like no like an eight inch blade i like actually like a 10 inch blade uh, that works better i have a 10 inch machete that i've cut down to that size that i like really well but uh, you're going to have to do some metal working to make that happen unless you have connections down South America somewhere. Uh, but this one you can order online. So again, it's a cold steel Bushman. Uh, it comes with different sheaths. I made my own here. Um, but some kind of a light chopper, some people call this. Something you can chop with and do the batoning like we talked about. Uh, also in the chopping category is a light hatchet. Uh, I got this through Smoky Mountain Knife Works. It's the Condor. I forget the model name right now. Uh, but something with a lightweight head that you, again, that you can chop with or use as a hammer. Uh, that comes in handy too. Um, and... 
the saw, which we talked about in the knife section. Um, so I'm not going to say a lot about that right now. But there's things that the, the machete or bush knife does better than the saw and the hatchet. There's things the saw does better than the bush knife or the hatchet. Things the hatchet does better than the saw and the bush knife. And so ideally you want to be able to have all three. Uh, again, it's too much weight for I think one person to try to carry all of them. But uh, if you could spread those out among the people you're regularly hiking with, that would be nice. The other important thing in the knife category is something to keep the knife sharpened with and this little pouch I have a sharpening stone here uh, and so learn how to sharpen your knives and to keep them sharp because dull knives literally don't cut it. Uh, a sharp knife is much safer than a dull knife because it will cut where you want it to cut uh, rather than you having to add a bunch of extra pressure and that increases the risk of slippage. Okay, uh, water bottle, cook pot, fire starter, tarp, cordage, adequate clothing, bedding, food, pack, knife, scarf is the last thing on the list. The scarf is probably the least essential item on this list, but the scarf is so versatile that it's earned itself a place on the list anyway. Uh, I mentioned earlier in one of the other sections about using this for uh, washcloth and towel. Uh, back in our early days we started carrying a bandana just because we heard it was a good thing to cover. We found to carry. Uh, they were so useful that we just kept carrying them and actually started carrying two or three bandanas. Uh, and then uh, we got into cravats for a while and then the uh, after the Gulf War, uh, the schmogs have become very common, and we really like those. Uh, these, because of the loose weave, you can use them for uh, mosquito netting, an extra layer of bedding, uh, emergency pack uh, to carry stuff in, uh, and so on. Uh, let me demonstrate one real handy uh, thing you can do with uh, any of these scarves, actually. But if you tie these adjacent corners together, I'm not going to actually tie them, but uh, you get the picture here, and tie these corners together, that gives you a bag, okay, with handles. So if you run across a patch of wild edibles and you want something to put them in, uh, you can get a bag here really quick. So uh, that's a big plus for uh, the scarf category. Uh, also, uh, it makes a good uh, tablecloth or um, clean work area, um, first aid applications, learn some of those. Uh, we've even used them for diapers and, you know, headgear and so on. Just the list goes on and on and on. Now, beyond those main items, uh, there are some extras, and the top of that list is uh, a Bible and maybe some worship materials, which is what I have here. Uh, this one's just the New Testament Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, I like that really well. It's lightweight, but it has you know most of what I want in there, uh, and so and keep it in a Ziploc bag. Uh, if your pack happens to fall in the creek, uh, you, I've ruined more than one Bible by that happening, and so I just learned to keep it in. Uh, a Ziploc bag. Uh, a first aid kit of some sort is always good to carry along. Uh, some kind of a headlamp or flashlight, uh, whistle for whistle signals. Uh, whistle carry a lot farther than your voice and even if you get hoarse as long as you can breathe you can toot on the whistle. Develop a set of whistle signals with the people that you're hiking with regularly. Uh, <clears throat> just keep in mind that three blasts is a recognized signal by sheriff's rescue people and um, the rangers and so on. That means I need help. Uh, so use some other signals in that. We have a signal, one blast means like here I am, where are you, let's stay in touch. Uh, two blasts means let's get together and then the three blast means I need help. Uh, toilet paper, uh, that's pretty obvious what you need that for. Uh, to save weight and bulk, I've taken the center cardboard 
piece out and again keep that in a Ziploc uh, so it doesn't get ruined by getting wet. And uh, the other thing here is um, a digging stick which uh, probably noticed we've been using it throughout the video. Uh, just comes in handy for a lot of different things. Uh, like the spoon, I used to not carry a digging stick uh, because my thinking was, well, I've got the tools, I can easily make one. Uh, but then sometimes, you know, you want one and you don't have time to make one. And in the verse that we read in the sanitation section, it talks about carrying pointed stick with you anyway. So I've started carrying one more recently. Uh, a little lighter weight one than, than what I would typically want, but uh, gets the job done for most things. Um, and so here we have, uh, these are the main things that I would want to carry with me uh, and have for any, you know, 24 hour or longer uh, time out in, the, out in nature. Um, and, you know, packed to be able to put it all in, too. Uh, <clears throat> I actually have two packs. I'm not recommending that everybody does that, but I have one main pack that was like my basic grab and go pack. I keep that packed up all the time in my vehicle, uh, ready to go. Uh, I keep my sleeping bag next to that. It's not in the pack, but it's right, you know, close to it. Um, so if, you know, in case of an emergency or something, I have everything I need there. The other pack I have, which a lot of these items are, are actually out of, uh, is what I call my Sabbath afternoon pack. It's just an afternoon hike pack. Uh, I still want to have all of these. I know of three instances uh, in the Southern California er area, uh, probably within a 120 mile radius, no less than that, 100 mile radius of each other, um, of Adventist groups that have gone out on a Sabbath afternoon hike, and they weren't planning to spend the night, so they didn't bring anything with them except maybe a water bottle, and they ended up spending the night for one reason or other. And I'm thinking, well, if that can happen to three groups that I know of within that small an area, I'm sure it's happened to many other people, you know, across the country. So it's wise to carry along what you might need, even on a Sabbath afternoon hike where you're not planning to spend the night at all. And so, like I said, a lot of these items, you know, not all of them necessarily, but at least all of the basic ones I would want to carry even on a simple Sabbath afternoon hike. So, to tie all this back with what we uh, talked about at the very beginning of the video, uh, we're not doing these things because they're interesting activities or something fun to do or something good just in case we get stuck in the woods. Uh, as Christians, we, God has told us the prophecies so that we can be wise and foresee what's coming uh, and know what we're going to be faced with. And so we'd be wise to learn these skills, put this equipment together so that we have it all in a kit. So when the time comes to go, we'll be ready. Uh, remember to keep your equipment sustainable. Uh, remember the other, you know, items that all the items that we need in order to make life happen. Uh, just, you know, picture the different equipment items that we've used to do the different activities that we've done, uh, as well as what we just got through talking about here where we looked at the equipment as a whole. And be sure and practice, okay, what you're doing, uh, rather than just being theory. Or keep in mind, um, if you can't make it work in your backyard on a sunny afternoon, you're not gonna be able to get it work up in the mountain in the dark when it's raining and so field test all of your equipment know how it all works um, and then go on some trips to actually practice this now you can do an awful lot on just an afternoon hike uh, but let the goal of your trip be to develop their skills and learn your wilderness knowledge uh, rather than just to get some destination and back and so stop and smell the roses, you know, stop and play with stuff you find along the way. If you find a wild edible and it's okay to make fire, maybe stop and cook it. You know, that'll help fix it in your mind uh, and, and help you to learn the plant and also develop fire building skills and fire cooking skills and so on. And so this just all works together. But if you don't have the equipment to be able to do that, 
you know, then you can't, and you miss the opportunity. So uh, I want to aim you to three things that you need in order to make wilderness living work. The first one is wilderness knowledge. Uh, this is just knowledge, you know, like of what plants might be edible, knowledge of direction finding techniques and so on, uh, what woods throw sparks and which don't and so on, those kind of things, just knowledge. Uh, the second one is having the equipment to be able to do it with. And then the third one is the skills to put it all together. Uh, these, interestingly enough, you need these same three things in order to play a, a musical instrument, okay? You need knowledge, you know, how to read the music and so on. You need to have the instrument and then you need to have skill so that it sounds good, you know, when you play it. Um, and real simply, you can't, I'm just going to pick a violin because that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Uh, you can't play a violin unless you have a violin to play. Okay, and so putting this equipment together is in, and carrying this equipment with you on your excursions out into nature is important because then you have the equipment to learn how to play and develop the skills. Um, so work on developing these three things. Now I suggest that you start out with the equipment and then work at developing the skills with the equipment, both in your backyard and out in nature, and then develop wilderness knowledge along the way as you're learning and recognize you need to learn you know, new things or finding out more about different plants and, and things that are growing out in nature.